Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a double header for you. On one half of the video, it's going to be a perfumer's portfolio video dedicated to Cecile Zerokian, who has made quite a name for herself in the last decade in the perfume world. I would say some good and some bad. Mixed results is kind of the way that I uh, look at her work. However, she has done a lot of fragrances, over a hundred. I'm actually really uh, excited to smell some of the things from her that I have not smelled yet. And what prompted this video is actually, I got an Instagram message today from a friend who said, did you know Cecile Zerokian has her own brand? And I went, what? What is it? I've never even heard of it. And apparently it's called Benigna, Benigna Perfumes. I guess that's how you say it. B-E-N-I-G-N-A. Benigna must be uh, Benigna, unless it's Benigna, which that doesn't sound very royal and exquisite, if you ask me. And it looks like her brand is all about royal and exquisite. She's trying to do the Roja Dove model, it looks like. Uh, for example, the very first one that pops up is the Royal Essences Collection. Um, Supreme Majesty is the first one. And I was like, oh, 85 bucks, that's not bad. That's for 15 mil. For 75 mil... It's $395. Now, the bottles are beautiful. They look crystal cut diamonds. There's like rare gems around the cap. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting a little tired of these brands coming out with uh, a fragrance and it's instantly $400. I mean, it's 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 unsustainable, if you ask me. Anyways, um, I, but I would love to smell some of, um, some of these fragrances because it looks like they're using really high quality materials and I've never even heard of them, and, and I'm a perfume addict. I've never heard anyone talk about them. Um, how this brand she started years ago, it's not new. Uh, well, it is relatively new, but I think they started in 2020. I would I would love to um, one day get to smell these, but I don't, uh, I'm sure as heck not going to, um, I'm sure as heck not going to pay these kind of prices, and doesn't look like they make sampling very easy either. They do have a discovery set where you can buy all of the 15 mil bottles of all of the, you know, fragrances they put out. But it's like, um, it's, it's like $595 for seven bottles in 15 mil. I mean, that would be cool. But um, that would be a great way for someone like me to try all of the house. But I'm not. I'm not going to pay five hundred ninety-five dollars on a whim. So um, yeah, just I thought I should mention that. That's what sort of sparked the video. As I learned, she had a new fragrance house. I wanted to discuss it with you guys. And um, also, we have the second half of the unboxing. Well, obviously, we're going to have a perfumer's portfolio video ranked. I'm going to rank my uh, top eight. Scents from Cecile Zerokian that I've smelled. Those are the only eight that I have in the collection. Actually, I don't even have some of them in full bottles. Some of them are, are, are decants, but uh, it's going to be a top eight from her. And we are going to do an unboxing. So let's do the unboxing first. Let's get this out of the way. Um, the last of the hauls continue. Um, maybe I do say that a little tongue in cheek because I do have another haul coming. Um, but... Uh, but yes, they will be they will be drying up soon, I promise. Can't be buying forever, I suppose. But there is still so much that I want to try. So much in the perfume world to get to know. I guess I should sell off some stuff too that uh, that I don't wear. But when I tried to sell some of the stuff I'm not wearing, no one wanted it. I sent it to Mudasir, no one wanted it. But then someone did come forward and say that they would buy the bottle of... Um, Cedrat Boise, but I told him I wanted to review it first, so it might be a little while. So I, I guess I also have a hard time selling things and letting things go. Um, I like to have it in the collection as a, almost like a little bit of a reference, you know, a museum, a little perfume museum in case I need to reference it one day. You know, if we're talking about something, I can grab it, I can show you guys the bottle, I can discuss it. So having a channel, it is um, I wouldn't say necessary, but it's handy to have these, these bottles like right behind you or, or lying, you know, lying around where you can spray it and remind yourself of it and stuff like that. Okay. So let me show you what I recently bought. And this is actually a discontinued fragrance. Go figure. It came out 19 years ago and it's from the house of Montana. And if you've been following the channel, you know exactly what this is because I did a early impression video on it. 
thanks to shout out to my uh, brother Keith from Malta. Uh, Manly Sense, he actually sent me a sample of this and I tried it and I wore it as my scent of the day and I thought, you know what, that is good enough that I actually want a bottle. Because even though it's only a 19 year old scent, it came out in the year 2004, it smells like it came out in the 80s and I really like the fragrance. So uh, obviously they're not using my source sandalwood or anything like that in 2004, but I still think the blend is really good. Uh, I really enjoyed wearing it, and I got a 100 mil bottle at a very fair price. So this is called Montana Camor. I don't know if it's Camore or Camor, but um, I've been saying Camor, so I'm going to stick with it. But uh, if anyone knows differently, do let me know. Uh, so this is the packaging. And let's see, there's the... Diana De Silva Cosmetics. So... Um, let's open this bad boy, shall we? So here it is. Here's the bottle. Montana Camor. I sampled something, I liked it, and I found it at a good price, and I bought it. How's that? That's how it's supposed to work. Um, I don't know if this has ever been sprayed. Looks brand new, but, uh, but yeah, so nothing crazy on the packaging. Uh, the cap is pretty cheap plastic, but I said in the video that this really felt like a little bit of a comeback for Montana because... Um, after 1989, when the 90s hit, in 1989, he put out his best fragrance for me, and that's Montana Parfum Dome. That's his, that's the best fragrance of the house, hands down. And then it would probably be, you know, something like maybe graphite or something like that. But, uh, this is right there with Runner Up, I would say. Um, this is a little bit of a comeback for the house to me in 2004. It's a brave release, putting out a fragrance like this in 2004. So, uh, you are going to go down and live with your friends, your Montana friends. Um, okay, here you go. You are going to live right here. Okay. All right, so that takes care of the unboxing, so you guys know what I'm kind of buying, what I'm going for. They also sent me a little tester of something. Let's see what this is. Let's see what special mini I got here, or sample. Ah, it actually, <laughs> what is this? Uh, this is, what in the world? This is a four mil mini of Montana's Oh, this is Parfum Dome. It is Parfum Dome. I know they had different versions. I didn't know which one this was. Um, so yes, this is a four mil. Look at this little thing. So it, it looks like the actual bottle of Montana Parfum Dome, but it opens up like so. Kind of cool. Kind of a cool little deal. Uh, this is the best Montana as far as I'm concerned, but be careful because they have some uh, fragrances from the House of Montana that sort of look like this, but, uh, the, the bottles are a little bit different. I think instead of coming out in 89, one of them came out in the early 2000s, and I don't think it's anywhere near as good as the OG. So, anyways, um, enough about the House of Montana. So, I will talk about, go check out my video of Camor if you're interested in learning more, but ultimately I have to do a review on, on the OG, uh, Montana Parfum Dome one day. Okay, so let's talk about Cecile Zerokian. Let's talk a little bit about her background before we get into the scents themselves. And um, so a little bit about her. So she is based in Paris, and she is an independent perfumer. So she actually founded her own company very early on, in 2011. And in 2011, I think that's actually the very first... Um, release date for one of one of the fragrances we're going to discuss. That's her, some of her earliest work is right around that time, 2011-ish. Um, and so almost from the beginning, you know, she, uh, I think she, I don't know how she uh, started out basically independent that quickly and got this level of work so quick, but she skyrocketed up the, up the ladder. She was doing big projects almost instantly. And I think Amouage was a big part of that, honestly, because it seemed like Christopher Chong and her hit it off very early on. 
And it says she's created over 100 fragrances for various brands in the European, Middle Eastern, and Latin American perfume markets. In addition to her creation skills as a perfumer in fine fragrance, home care, and body care, Cecile works with international brands as a consultant in scent branding, uh, helping them to create and develop their olfactory identity. Okay. Her scent marketing experience leads her to design multi-sensory experience for unique events and activities activations. She also runs master classes, workshops, and perfume seminars in North, North Central and South America, Asia, and Europe. I need to be a, um, uh, what did she call it? A scent brander? I need to be a scent brander. Um, pay me a bunch of money and I'll help you develop your olfactory identity. Man, uh, where did I go wrong? In 2019, she took up the challenge to enter the Latin American market and started with Brazil by creating the scent of Granados Bosa, complete line, launched in 2020 for this iconic uh, Carioca brand's 150-year anniversary. Never smelled any of that. Cecile's been working in the perfume industry for more than 15 years, starting with a four-year training with Robert Tet, a leading French fragrance house. There, she created her first fragrance, Epic Woman, one of the best-selling fragrances of Amouage today, right before she graduated from ISI PCA, the internationally recognized perfume training school founded by... J.J. Guerlain in Versailles. Um, so, um, very interesting that they say she created her first fragrance right before she graduated. So that shows how quickly. I mean, they gave her a huge project, basically, early, early on in her career. And I think since it was such a hit, it kick-started her career. An artistic project she developed with an illustrator jump-started her career and gave birth to an exhibition that traveled Europe. Paris in 2011, London 2013. Uh, the objective of this project entitled IP01 was to correlate six visuals and six perfumes in perfect harmony. Each universe gives birth to the other and vice versa. The paintbrush follows the olfactive narrative while the nose is led by the sketch. Very interesting. Uh, very, very interesting indeed. So uh, she actually has her own website, CecileZerokian.com. And you can go see all of the fragrances that she has created. Um, there are many, many of these fragrances I've never smelled before. So again, I only have eight listed on the on the uh, video today because that's all I have in the collection. So um, even though she has all of these fragrances that she's done, even somebody like me who loves smelling as much as I can... Um, and, you know, getting my nose on as much as, as I can and all that stuff. I still only have a very small, you know, cross-section of her work. So no one can smell everything. I mean, even the, um, even the people who have teams of people that work with them to try and smell as many things as they can and compile it in, in dictionary-like books and, and website databases, they can't smell everything. It's impossible. There's just so much out there nowadays. So one person like me, you know, you can only do what you can do. And and I've obviously barely made a small dent in, in all of her work. Um, but I think I understand her, her uh, the way that she functions. And I understand sort of her DNA. I can pick out a very distinctive ambery DNA that she's done that you can smell across a couple of these. And I can pick out a very distinctive sort of smoky DNA that she's done across a couple of others. So... So let's get started. Uh, and again, this is my list, my ranking. Uh, I'm just, I'm not saying that one is better than eight. I'm not saying that two is better than seven. Uh, these are just my preferences. And this is today, as of um, May the uh, 17th, 2023. Ask me tomorrow. Things could be completely different. But uh, this is just my preference. But before we get started, let us do what is customary on Channel Ram which is discuss the scent of the day. So, scent of the day today is actually a feminine targeted fragrance from the 80s, from 1987. It's a discontinued gem of a fragrance. Huh? Huh? It's actually Van Cleef and Arpels gem. And uh, this is a true treat to own and wear. Um, you can see this is a proper vintage bottle. You can tell by the 82 proof. Um, and there's some sort of writing on the back. You see this bottle had to be sourced from overseas. It is um, not easy to find at all. Even if you go to the special auction site everyone loves discussing, 
you'll have a hard time finding gem. It is not easy to uh, to hunt down, but well worth the hunt in my opinion. Uh, and don't let the fact that this is targeted towards women put you off if you're a guy. This is completely unisex. It is technically, I think, classified as a spicy floral fragrance. Uh, and I think that's fair, but I, I would uh, put it in the category of, oh, it's fantastic. It's beautiful. It's, um, you know, what's interesting about this is to my nose, there's a very distinctive aldehydic facet to the opening of this. And you may be thinking aldehydic floral run the other way. Not true at all because it's blended in an oriental style. Um, and there is something that's very 80s about it. If you know the big, heavy oriental, you know, just huge fragrances. Think of the huge hair in the 80s. Sometimes that's how it was with fragrances. So think of something like, uh, think of how big this is, right? Poison by Dior, one of the best selling women's fragrances of all time. Think of how massive poison is and how there's, there's just so much going on. And even though there's things like tuberose and there's rose and jasmine and all of these notes in here, uh, you still pick up all of these other facets, and that's sort of how gem feels to me. I get aldehydes, even though it's not listed. I get spices, cardamom, myrtle, uh, woods, cypress, and patchouli, and there's clove, which I think the clove in this, um, you, and it is an oriental, so you could say this reminds me of sort of a mashup of fragrances like this, this style from the 80s. Um, but the clove will remind you a little bit of things like YSL's um, Opium, the, the OG, sitting right here. Uh, beautiful. One of the best Orientals of all time. But the fragrance itself will remind you the closest of something like this. Uh, Edmund Rudnitska's Femme, who some say this is his masterpiece. I would agree if it wasn't for the fact that he did Eau de Hermes. Eau de Hermes, to me, will always be Edmund Rudnitska's masterpiece, but this is a very close runner-up. And don't, again, if you're a guy, don't let the fact that this says femme stop you from appreciating just how beautiful femme is. The difference is, though, that femme has that Edmund Rudnitska sort of punch in the face in the opening, which I love. And it has that, you know, cumin y. Uh, and I know Olivier Cresp sort of turned up the cumin on the reformulation. This is an 80s uh, parfum to toilet bottle, or early 90s. I can't exactly date it. Uh, late 80s, early 90s Parfum de Toilette bottle, which they don't do the Parfum de Toilette anymore. Um, and so if, you, if you've if you smelled Rochas Femme with that sort of plum, right, and that oriental style and the, and the DNA that uh, Edmund Runitska did with Femme, you'll have an idea of Van Cleef and Arpel's gem and where they're going with it, okay? But there's differences, obviously. There's both peach and plum in here. There's rosewood in here. There's coriander, myrtle, cardamom, and cypress. That's just the top. The heart is clove, jasmine, tuberose, which could put some guys off because usually tuberose is a no-no. But the way it's blended with the oriental, it's kind of like this for me. You know, there's tuberose in here, but I can still wear it because of the blend. Same for gem. And I actually wore this to work today. I wore this with my collared shirt to work today. It was beautiful. Fantastic. And it was uh, in the 80s in Texas, and it worked beautiful. Oh, and there's this carnation note, which is just bang spot on. I miss a good carnation note. Uh, one of the things I miss in modern perfume, beautiful orris root, rose, ylang ylang, iris, with a base of oak moss, vetiver, amber, civet, slightly animalic, uh, patchouli, and vanilla. But what a fragrance this is, man. And uh, shocked that more vintage heads don't talk about gem. I think it's just because it's hard to find. It's extremely hard to come by. Um, and usually when you do, people jack the price up because of how rare it is to find. But, uh, man, gem truly is a gem to me. Uh, and the perfumer is Roger Pellegrino. And, and you know, between the note listing and what I've said about it and then saying the name Roger Pellegrino, if you're a big frag head, that should have you running for to see if you can hunt down a couple mils of that to experience it. But I'm shocked there's no aldehyde note because I get a big, especially... In the opening and into the mid, now they're sort of dying off. Like, it's been on my skin for about an hour now, uh, maybe a little bit less, 45 minutes or so. Um, and so it's dying. I'm, I'm not getting as much of the aldehydes as the first 45 minutes, but, uh, man, I'm shocked there's no aldehydic note listed. I think that's one of the biggest difference between these two. 
but these are definitely the two closest fragrances that I've smelled together. Uh, but this is from the 40s and this is from the uh, 80s. So, uh, Van Cleef and Arpels Gem was my scent of the day. All right, so let's get into this. Top eight. Number eight, Cecile Zerokian scent for me, is going to be a release that came out in 2020. I only have a... Um, I only have a little sample. I have not done a video on this yet, though. And so what I'm thinking about doing with this brand is doing a live stream, kind of like what I did with uh, Fragrance Dubois, where I did all, you know, like six fragrances at once because I'm not really very happy with this brand, to be honest with you. I actually have it right here. Uh, this is called Mellow Yellow, by the way. It's called Mellow Yellow. And um, it's kind of... This is a weird fragrance because... Now, to be fair, I have not put this on skin, so this is just from paper, which sometimes can uh, enhance some aspects of a fragrance, and it can really de-emphasize other aspects that maybe are important. But it's sort of, I would, you know, Parfumo considers this a citrusy green scent, and I would agree. There's some other things going on. Um, there's Oris Absolute listed and Carrot Seed, which I actually really like Carrot Seed in a, in a fragrance because Carrot Seed can come across as very powdery, very similar to smelling like Iris, but it's a cheaper note compared to Iris, so sometimes perfumes will put Carrot Seed into a fragrance, I think, to save money, but also it gives a little different scent profile, and honestly, I don't care about that. It's all about the smell for me. There's a little bit of clove, but it's this sort of very almost headache-inducing, um, they say dry woods in cashmere wood, which is cashmeran, as you know. But uh, there's this very synthetic feeling to this brand, and I felt the exact same way about... I have one video on this brand on the channel. It's it's called Patty Shetty. Uh, and Patty Shetty, I think, was done by Nathalie Feisthauer. Don't quote me on that, but... I was not a fan of that at all. That was extremely disgustingly sweet and synthetic. And even though this isn't disgustingly sweet, um, it it is very synthetic. And it has this... It has this sort of orange blossom note which comes across as smelling cheap. Uh, I don't, I'm not a fan of this brand from what I've smelled so far. Um, so, Astrophil and Stella's Mellow... Yellow is actually uh, number eight on the list. So I will do a video on this, I guess. Uh, either I'll do an individual sort of, you know, review, or I will do a live stream where I can lump six of these together and just knock them out and get the brand off my plate. Because I do have probably um, six or seven other samples from this house that I still haven't talked about yet. This is one of them. I've been waiting to talk about this, but... Uh, doesn't necessarily mean I have good things to say, but uh, I've been waiting to discuss this. the rest of this Astrophil and Stella brand, and um, Mellow Yellow to me is it's a big no-no, and I think it dries down from... I've sprayed this on a card once before, and I think it dries down to this sort of generic, boring white musk, and then that really brings out more of the Orange Blossom Accord. Yeah, I don't like that. I, uh... I think uh, I think me and that brand are just going to have to agree to disagree on what a good perfume is. Okay, quick uh, rehydration, and then we'll move on to number seven. Okay, number seven on the list is uh, a fragrance that got a lot of hype in Fragcom, I would say, in the last couple years. Uh, it actually came out in the year... Uh, 2019, so it's a year older than Mellow Yellow, and um, it is a vanilla-based scent. It's for a house that I actually really like. I like this house. Even though they're a modern niche house, I do like this house. I, I rate the house. The house is Nishane, and the fragrance is called Ani. Now, uh, this is one that is on the potential to sell list, I would say. Um, it's, it's a potential to sell list for me, although... I don't, the thing is, I just don't sell fragrances, so I keep, I keep thinking, well, maybe I'll want this one day, maybe I'll want to, um, do a video on it, I still haven't done a video, so I'll have to do a video before I end up selling anything, but, uh, Ani is a very strange blend, okay, because actually you can smell, there's a slight touch of creaminess in Mellow Yellow, and it's interesting because you can smell, and remember how I said earlier that, 
um, some of the ambery facets, and we'll talk about that when we get to some of her other scents. Uh, there are there's a big similarity in the way she builds her amber accords between certain perfumes, and there's a big similarity between the way she sort of builds her dry, smoky accords, and we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Well, this is sort of lumped into the way that she does this sort of creamy vanilla, and um, you know I think this is a much better fragrance than Mellow Yellow, if you ask me, my personal opinion. I would actually wear Ani over Mellow Yellow any day of the week. Um, but it has a very strange blend, and I go back and forth on this fragrance, believe it or not. I actually put this fragrance on a video I did called, uh, I got tagged, I hate tag videos, but I did it. Uh, I got tagged in a video, and it was like, five fragrances you, um, love and five you hate, or five you used to love, or so I forgot what it was, but I did it, and this was the hate category. Uh, I do not like Ani. Uh, it, when I did the video, and then I kind of go back to it, and I spray it before I go to bed or something, and I think, you know what, it's not as bad as I made it out to be, but then I'll spray it again, or I'll smell some, I'll smell it in the dry down, I'm like, oh, it really is as bad as I made it out to be, so this is one I go back and forth on. Many times I hate it, but every now and then I'll catch a whiff, and I'm like, you know what, that's not that bad. Obviously, it's not Guerlain Vanilla, but what is? Um... But for me, I mean, Guerlain's the gold standard of vanilla, so I just really don't need anything else is the problem. Uh, and so this is basically considered a, a sweet, spicy vanilla fragrance. It has green notes in the top with bergamot, Thai ginger, and pink pepper. And believe it or not, that Thai ginger plays a big role in the scent because um, I would actually describe this scent as sort of a gingery, fresh vanilla creamy fresh vanilla very strange is is what this is it's very weird um it does have some spices and fruits it has cardamom black currant and turkish rose and actually you can sort of see uh the way when we get to the number one fragrance there's actually a slight connection between the way that she uses the rose and the fruits with the vanilla here in my favorite fragrance that she's ever done but the quality and the way that they smell are completely up, you know, on total opposite sides of, of the world. They're, they're completely bipolar. But there is this sort of benzoiny vanilla, and, and you'll notice a trend throughout her perfumes. Uh, and if so, if you know the way that she creates these benzoiny, ambery accords, you could maybe guess that this is a Cecile Zerokian creation. Um, I like it sometimes. I hate it sometimes, and so that's why it's at number seven. It's uh, better than Mellow Yellow, I'll tell you that, hands down, better than Mellow Yellow. I just don't know if it's any better than any of the others on the list. So, Ani comes in at uh, at number seven, and probably most people would consider this a cold weather scent, since it's vanilla, but because of this weird freshness to it, there's this creamy freshness to the scent, especially when you take into account that Thai ginger note. Uh, this, I think, is a vanilla that could be worn in warmer weather. Now, Ani is doing um, like a 10-year 10, 10 anniversary or so. I forget what they're doing. But they're putting out fragrances that have an X at the end. So she has her name on Ani X or something. Uh, I don't know if that's a little bit of a different fragrance or if it's just the exact same fragrance in a different bottle. But um, but either way, Ani comes in at number seven. Okay, and if you really want to take it one step further, I'll show you what the card that uh, Nishan A puts into their packagings. I guess that's what uh, Ani is supposed to smell like right there. There's a representation, a postcard, if you will. They say bergamot green notes, blue ginger instead of Thai ginger, and pink pepper, black currant, Turkish rose, and cardamom, patchouli, cedarwood, vanilla, benzoin, ambergris, musk, and sandalwood. Okay. All right. Enough of Ani. Let's go on to number six. And number six in the list for me is a fragrance that... I think maybe it was also a little bit of a Fragcom darling for a little bit. I think it's, um, oh, where's my cat? There it is. All right, let's put this away. So I think it is, um, it's a fragrance that I think is loved by most. However, I was watching the, uh, listening to the Les Odorants podcast, and they actually 
were pretty tough on this fragrance, and I haven't heard many people be too tough on this. I actually really like it. I don't love it. I wouldn't buy a full bottle, but I'm glad to have my little uh, 10 ml Discovery Atomizer, and this is from the house of Mask Milano, and this is called Tango. So Tango is literally inspired by the Tango, right? And um, it's an oriental style fragrance. Uh, and the notes are black pepper, cardamom, and bergamot in the top with cumin, damask rose, jasmine, sambac, absolute, and patchouli with a base of benzoin, amber, tonka bean, leather, musk, vanilla, and sweet clover, absolute. So if you think about two people dancing the tango together, what's going to happen? They're going to be sweaty. They're going to have this salty, sweaty uh, skin, you know, maybe even sweat, they're dancing, and then they take a break and like the sweat dries on their face, right? And it kind of turns slightly salty. When you first spray this, you're going to get hit with a blend that, again, we will come across in a later fragrance from her. And I hate to keep saying that, but it's really, you can really see if you like perfumers who have a very distinct style and they stick to that style, she is one where if you come across her creations and you really fall in love, you could safely chase other brands down and kind of see what she's done. But uh, in Tango, that cumin note plays a little bit of a role. It's not so much like, uh, it's not like La Enfant Tannibal by Javoy or anything like that where the cumin note is just so, so huge it might put you off. Um, but there is a cumin note in here. So if cumin is a no-no for you, you know, something to keep in mind. Um... I think it's a very well done amber. I don't think it's anything to, for me anyways, I don't think it's anything to write home about. I, um, I'm glad I have this. I, um, I'll wear it maybe like once a winter or something like that. I need to do a full review on this. I like the sort of resinous aspect of the dry down, if you will. And I like the spices. Um, I actually wish there was more cumin. I wish it was more animalic. I wish there was some civet in here Kind of like, you know, in the 80s when they did Amber, they added things like Civet in the base that made this a little bit more interesting. This is much more interesting to me. Um, much more interesting than, than Tango, which this is a very expensive fragrance. It shouldn't be like that. But sometimes that's the way it goes with these niche houses. And um, I like it. I like it. I do not love it. And um, I wish also I wish the leathery aspect in the base came out a little bit more. Um, from memory, you know, it also turns slightly sweet. There's a there's a little bit of a sweetened aspect to it. So, um, you know, for someone like me that has somewhat of a challenging palette, uh, I wish the cumin in the and I wish there was some more animalics. I wish the leather was turned up a little bit more. But um, it's, I think it's an easier amber wear than, than most people give it credit for. It almost presents itself as a very challenging, you know, tango dance, but uh, it actually comes across pretty, pretty tame for the most part. This is not, uh, you know, this is, this is not uh, professional level tango dancing or anything like that. This is, uh, I think this is a much easier wear than many in Fragcom give it credit for, if you have some experience with ambers. So, uh, but yes, it's definitely heavy on the benzoin, amber, tonka bean aspect of it, and even the vanilla, you know. Um, so you'll start to see her use of, of the vanilla uh, pretty pretty often in her, in her, de in her creations, and, and you'll get it in Tango as well. Okay, so that is number uh, six. Number five is a very interesting fragrance, and I have to give a special shout out to my brother uh, Armando for passing this along to me in one of my uh, recent hauls. Number five is a fragrance from the house of Pure Distance, and it's called Sheduna. So, Sheduna, this is actually a uh, 15 mil little discovery atomizer, and um, Sheduna uh, showed up in one of our blind sniffing episodes. So if you've been following the channel, there was actually one of the... Um, blind sniff episodes. I can't remember exactly which one, but I usually put the names in the description. So if you go click on my playlist and go to blind sniffs, you'll see that uh, one of them, I actually came across this. So if you want my thoughts, you can go check that out. But from memory, I remember 
Uh, when, so when I blind sniff these, I'm just sniffing the fragrance. I have no clue whether it's a niche, a vintage, whether it's expensive or cheap. I'm, I'm just completely blind. And I remember when I smelled this, the first thing I said is, it smells like there's an oud accord in here. And I was thinking that this is something like a Stefan Umber Lucas fragrance or something like that. Um, as it turned out, it was a pure distance fragrance. And as soon as I heard it was a Cecile Zerokian, I was like, you know what? It smells, the, the ambery benzoin accord smells so similar to tango. But some of my beefs, there's no leather in here, but some of my beefs, and in fact, there's even blackcurrant. So the, um, you know, uh, the fruit note is is the same as what they is, is what she used in Ani. So you can see there's a little bit of a recycle. At, she kind of sticks with what works sometimes, let's say. Um, but this has some notes that um, I think sort of push it over the edge, makes it feel more to my favorite style of her creations, which once we get to number one, it'll be apparent exactly which one that is. But it adds things like frankincense, okay? It adds things like uh, myrrh. And for the frankincense and myrrh addition for me really puts Shaduna over the top. It smells more exotic. It doesn't smell as... Sometimes Tango gets boring to me, even though... Like I said, it's um, held out there as this very challenging, um, you know, ambery fragrance with cumin, and it, and, it, and it can come across as many people hold it as being scary and challenging. To me, it's not. It can be boring. This is more interesting. This spices it up a little bit more than, than Tango. And um, Sheduna has a beautiful aldehydic floral accord in there as well. Um, she uses geranium and Bulgarian rose. Um, but even the way that she does the, uh, patchouli and vetiver in here seem a little, uh, a little higher class. I like, it adds some heft to the fragrance, you know, some heft. It's not boring. I love the frankincense. Uh, so yeah, so this is, uh, definitely smells niche. It smells expensive and, uh, I'm, I was a fan. I like this one. So thanks again to Armando for including this in, in the previous haul. Okay. Next on the list, and, and I'll read you what uh, Pure Distance says, by the way, too. They're an expensive brand. Did you know that they have, um, you can actually buy this, so this is a 17.5 mil, excuse me, Pure Distance, didn't mean to, you know, jip you a couple mils there, um, but Pure Distance, oh no, now my computer's going to make me sign back in, hang on, all apologies. Let's see if I can get back in to read you the little blurb I had saved. Okay, so it says that uh, Sheduna is a rich and intense perfume inspired by the panoramic views and feel of golden sand dunes in the desert during sunset. How's that for a specific reference? Golden sand dunes in the desert during sunset. Soft female curves changing from deep gold to warm, orangey red, embodying a promise of sensual comfort and silent seduction. Wearing Shaduna, one waft sensuality and intense color waves of Persian rugs touch the senses. The perfect marriage between sensuality and style. So they threw in the soft female curves thing, but I think this is completely a unisex fragrance. I have no problem wearing this. Um, and, but I like the whole desert idea. It almost harkens back, you know, it reminds me a little bit of um, imagery you would see in something like an Amouage, right? Because Amouage is an Omani house, and so she's she's added some of the frankincense and myrrh and that middle, a little more of this Middle Eastern style to it. And I, and I like that. So uh, Sheduna comes in at number five. Number four, and this is where it gets tough because for me, uh, I could almost take, um, I could almost take two, three, and four and just flip them together. You know, I ended up settling on this, and this is how I'm going to leave it. But four could be two, two could be three, three could be four. I mean, I could, I could mix and match all of these, but uh, I think this is a fair way to put it. But the, the line right here between 4, 3, and 2 is extremely razor thin. And then number 1 is kind of out on its own to me. So 
So number four is, and I have a video of this one on the channel, so you can check it out. I do not own a full bottle. I wouldn't mind a full bottle, but I would have to get a hell of a deal to make it worth my while. Uh, but this is called Royal Tobacco. So this is one of the newer Amouage fragrances from last year, and I probably have a couple mils left. Um, and you know what? This is a return to, I would say, more of Amouage's roots, okay? So I was extremely hard on Amouage and their new creative director, Raynaud Salman. I'm not a fan of the direction he's taking the house. I don't like the flankers that he's doing. I don't like the exceptional X-ray. I, I just don't, period. That's just my take on it as an old Amouage fanboy. And his take on it, which he basically said during a live stream is, oh, well, if the old people that like Amouage don't like where we're going, we'll just find new customers. And that is their take. That is that is um, kind of the stance that they've taken. And I think it's worked for them as far as sales go because they have been having these record blowout quarters. But they've sort of alienated the old timers. And I'm throwing myself into the old timers bunch, even though... I'm not really an old timer yet. I feel like an old timer by saying I miss the old days of Amouage, and I do. Um, but I do think that this is one of the better Amouages, modern Amouages. I didn't like um, some of the other stuff that they did before this. And um, uh, Royal Tobacco, if you are not familiar with the, um, if you're not familiar with the story, so basically. Um, they tell the story of the fact that Oman and uh, Cuba basically sit on a very similar um, uh, longitude on the globe, okay? Uh, believe it or not, they sit on a very similar longitude. And so he started to do some research into the, um, the history of Cuba. And of course, when you look at Cuba, you can't kind of look at Cuba without the history of making cigars. So from this is from memory. I don't have the, um, my computer sort of acting up, so I don't have the uh, story right here in front of me like I was hoping to read to you guys. But basically they found out that there were uh, these folks that were called lectors in the cigar making world, that the people making the cigars were actually more uh, productive when they were hearing a story, when they were being read to by one of the lectors. So they actually took one of the people off the floor from, um, you know, rolling cigars. So they took him away from his job and they had him read a book. And usually they would read, uh, I guess, ancient, uh, well, not ancient, but they would read um, stories like Romeo and Juliet. That's the kind of stuff that they like to, 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 to hear. And hence the name Romeo and Juliet Cigar. That's sort of uh, that's sort sort of where some of these names like that came from, uh, and he thought that uh, this uh, focus on sort of knowledge and stimulating the brain, not just you know using the whip and saying make as many cigars as possible or else, but um, you know sort of stimulating the 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 knowledge side of of the floor, was a very interesting and novel concept, and so they created this royal tobacco to uh, honor both Cuba and Oman, the royal. Hojari incense, I think, is what the where the royal name came from, and then tobacco, of course, from Cuba. So, um, I, I have a review on this again. If you want to kind of go a little bit deeper, but it's anise, cardamom, elemi, frankincense oil, basil, and bergamot. And I can tell you, it does go on the skin very oily. There is something very true to that frankincense oil name um, blurb right there, because this goes on the skin extremely oily. And one of the um, notes that really pops out is the note of licorice root. And I said it in the review, I believe, but the licorice root note reminds me a lot of this fragrance, which I absolutely love. Um, it's from the house of Yoji Yamamoto, and it's called Yoji Om. This has a beautiful uh, licorice root with uh, actually liquor. Um, and it's a, it's a very sort of warm modern fragrance, but it wears very light for what it is. So this, because it's a Japanese house, they don't like their fragrance to be screaming, right? So even though it's a very heavy, warm, it has a lot of these uh, notes that you would associate with a big, bold fragrance, it's not. It sort of wears lighter and it's easier to wear. I could wear this all year round easily, even though it has liquor and, and um, you know, licorice and, and tobacco and stuff like that. I think there's tobacco in there. But um, with 
Royal Tobacco, it's kind of the opposite. Uh, this wears extreme, this is a beast. It wears very heavy. Uh, there's a fenugreek note, which some say gives off a warm milk-like vibe. And I know what they're talking about, but uh, it wouldn't put me off at all. There is lavender, so it has a slightly still old-school traditional aspect to the scent. Uh, Osmanthus, one of my favorite florals of all time, um, comes across as very leathery and almost nectarine-like, uh, somewhat animalic as well, with orange blossom, prunol, rose, frankincense, benzoin, gaiac wood, myrrh, peru balsam, tonka bean, Assam oud, uh, birch tar, bourbon vanilla, labdanum, musk, and vetiver. And, um, it's a fantastic creation. I, I was really a big fan of uh, Royal Tobacco. I liked the tobacco note. I I, uh, I liked the fact that this felt like a little bit of a return to old school Amouage style of fragrance. Um, so yes, go check out my review if you want to learn more about Royal Tobacco. But this is what ended up at number four on the list. Um, number three. Number three is, uh, and this was also very tough between three and number two, but number three for me ended up being a Javoy fragrance, one of her earlier releases from the year 2011, and this is called Private Label. Uh, my brother Thomas uh, from Early Greek says that this is uh, a fragrance that he considers to be a daily driver. And daily driver fragrances are fragrances that you can just grab, spray on, even if it's pissing down rain, and it just works, you know. And actually, this fragrance does work great in the rain. But uh, it's woody, it's leathery, it's deep. Uh, private label is also a beast. This thing lasts 12 hours on my skin. Easy. Um, you could probably even smell it for more than, than 12. But it's extremely masculine because it has this very dry, dark, um, almost grainy papyrus note. So think about this very papery, uh, grain feeling with patchouli, heavy patchouli, leather, beautiful vetiver. I would actually say vetiver, um, probably the main notes to my nose would be papyrus, vetiver, um, and this almost leathery, uh, smoky, sort of uh, birch tar in, in the dry down. Uh, there is labdanum as well, which labdanum um, adds this resiny, leathery, leathery facet to it, but it's extremely smoky, earthy, butch, dark, almost like smelling a, uh, almost like, imagine you're smelling like a unknown, like a vetiver oil that's never been discovered before. And it has these, you know how sometimes, um, Certain types of vetiver oil will smell either more earthy or more clean or crisp. Imagine that this one just smells extremely smoky and um, smoky and extra earthy with that grainy papyrus. But imagine it's the vetiver oil itself that you're smelling. Like it has this birch tar leathery feel, but it's actually the vetiver itself. That's kind of what the scent smells like. It has this extreme... It has this workman's almost masculinity to it. There's like a, imagine like a working man and imagine his hands. And unlike my hands, which you can tell is not a working man's hands. It's a typing on a keyboard hands. Uh, but imagine like a working man man's hands. And imagine like the calluses on his hands, right? That's, that's the feeling that this fragrance gives me because there is almost no sweetness in it. Almost none. And it also has a beautiful woody-like dry down. So there's cedar and sandalwood in the base, uh, but it's extremely butch, extremely masculine, almost no sweetness, and um, dark, earthy, smoky, leathery, just a fantastic, one of my favorite Javoy fragrances, Private Label. Um, I think this is a very underrated house, just because, you know, it doesn't, uh, doesn't have Swarovski crystals on the on the cap or anything like that. I do think that this everything that you get from this house is premium, even the juice inside. And you don't pay super high. You're not like with that uh, Benigna perfumes that um, that Cecile Zerokian is her brand. You know, starting at whatever that one I, I talked three hundred ninety five dollars. You can find these pretty regularly in the one fifties, and I think that's a great value for what you're getting for. 
for the fragrance. So I'm, I'm a fan of the House of uh, Javoy. Okay, so that was Private Label. Next on the list, number two. And the top two are both Amwages, believe it or not. But number two is from 2021. And I actually think it's the best release of uh, Raynal Salman's career as creative director. Okay? And this is Silver Oud. Now, I have a little bit of misgivings with this scent because I actually tested it originally. Um, I tested it in the 50 mil bottle, the old school 50 mil bottle. And almost the collector in me wanted the older one since it's no longer available. But I got such a great deal on this. I got this like whole 100 mil 350 shipped. And I was like, I can't say no to that because it's 500 MSRP. Some people are telling me there are deals out there now for 290 to 300 shipped on this. And, and I paid no tax because I got it from Max Aroma. You don't pay taxes in, in Texas if you buy from Max Aroma. Anyways, um, Amouage Opus 13 Silver Oud is I think the best release under Reynolds Salman because it has this, it has things that I like. You know, it's a very, it can be a very challenging fragrance to some. For me, I had absolutely no problem wearing it. There's a Samoud, um, there's Cipriol on the top and you will get that Cipriol. This is probably one of the best Cipriol fragrances. I have an entire, uh, this is not a top 10 Cipriol video dedicated to the note of Cipriol. If you want to learn more about it, Nagamatha, Cipriol oil, uh, they basically are interchangeable. Go check that out. But this has this Virginia cedar and patchouli with a base of birch, castorium, amber rome, and guyac wood. And um, I like the fact that the castorium does come out in the base. Um, but if you smell this, and you smell this, the way that she used the birch, now this doesn't have any oud, but this does have a very dark vetiver. So imagine she sort of took the DNA for private label and added this amouage style uh, oud with this modern amouage, you know, feel to it. Smoky, woody, uh, ways that I would describe private label. So again, it's, it's very interesting the way that she does her creations, but... Um, I really like this, and Private Label was almost number two, by the way. That's how much I, I really like Private Label. But uh, Silver Oud ended up edging it out on this video, uh, mostly because of the castorium and the animalic aspect to it. And for a modern Oud fragrance, okay? I know the word Oud just gets thrown in everything nowadays, and they jack the price up to 500 bucks. For a modern Oud, from one of these types of houses, right? Not the Ensars, the Aris, the Dores, the Bortnikovs. They're in their own world, right? They're at the top of the mountain in their own world. But for these type of oud fragrances, this is a great oud. This is a well done oud, uh, in my opinion. So, silver oud, as much as I hate to say it, I think it's a good release from the House of Amouage under, under the Fishman, the Salmon. Okay, so that leaves only number one, and we're going to do this video under an hour if I can get to it, but uh, number one is her first release from the year 2009, and it actually is Epic Woman, and I have to give a special shout out to some of the folks like Euro Rose and a couple other people from the channel. Um, they really constantly beat their chest and said, Ramsey, you have to try Epic Woman, and Many times I just ignored the women's side of Amouage when I was initially collecting because I stuck with the men's uh, and I was wrong to do that. I actually have an entire live stream video dedicated to testing women's Amouage fragrances and there's a couple that are high on the list. I really want Beloved Woman and I really want... Um, uh, there's another women's scent that just really blew me away. Uh, Memoir Woman. Oh, man. Memoir Woman was fantastic. Um, but Epic Woman, to me, is her best creation. This encompasses that DNA that she then took and sort of tweaked in Tango. And Shaduna started here. It started here. Uh, and if you look at the note listing, you'll see the similarities. This has pink pepper cumin, cinnamon, damask rose, geranium, tea, jasmine, frankincense, patchouli, amber, guyac wood, iris, oud, sandalwood, musk, and vanilla. Sound familiar as a note listing? Very, very similar note listings to 
uh, Tango. Tango was Cumin, Damas, Jasmine, you know, Amber, Benz. I mean, they just, it seems like she just sort of plug and play ingredients here and there uh, to my nose. And if you smell this, okay, if you smell Epic Woman and then you instantly smell Tango and then you instantly smell Shaduna, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, it's, it's clear as day, the similarities, but this is the best of the bunch. She had help with this, okay? So this DNA that she created wasn't just on her own. She worked with Danielle Mordial and Angeline Leporini, okay? So this was like a trio of perfumers that ended up making Epic Woman. But she also helped or also did the Epic 56, which is a good uh, release from the Exceptional X-Ray line. But there was just no reason for me to get it since I have an older bottle of... Um, Epic Woman, and man, this is so good. Oh, you know, one thing that you will notice, so that pink pepper cumin cinnamon thing that I mentioned a little bit in Tango that seemed a little boring, it's perfected here. It is not boring here because it has that frankincense from Shaduna. So the frankincense makes a big difference, but it goes even further here. It adds the oud, and in my blind sniff of Shaduna, if you go watch that, if you're interested, and this is when I had no clue what I was smelling, I instantly said, it smells like there's an oud accord in here. And I'm very curious if there really is. They didn't list it because there's an oud accord in here. Uh, oud and frankincense and iris in the base. The iris is extremely posh. I don't think there's iris in, um, I don't think there is iris in Shaduna. They went with myrrh is what they ended up doing. So they added, you know, another... Uh, sort of warm, myrrh adds this very amount of huge amount of warmth and you can smell it. That's one of the, that's one of the things that gives it that golden dune color that they were talking about in the description. It's the myrrh. It's missing from here. And, but what they've added here that I absolutely love is tea. The tea note here almost makes my mouth water. It is so spot on. It almost reminds me of the tea note in Silver Mountain Water. If you could just pluck that tea note out of Silver Mountain Water on its own. Forget about the rest of the fragrance, but just the way the tea note is executed. Imagine Silver Mountain Water tea in an amouage. It's just perfection. I mean, I almost slapped myself in the face when I uh, discovered what this was, and the fact that I passed it over so many times. Thank God my brother Mudasir had an older bottle. This is uh, when it was Oman uh, Perfumery, before the Amouage SAOC thing. This is when it was Oman Perfumery LLC, so it's one of the older ones. Um, it is still a magnetic cap, but it's one of the older bottles, and I I adore this stuff. This is um, probably the the one of the best women's Amouages for me, up there with Jubilation Woman. Um, Jubilation Woman and, and Epic Woman sort of battle for the top spot, if you will. But yeah, Spicy Oriental, the accords that she continued on and that, to me, made her career were here. And um, it's 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 so classy and yet elegant. It's And, it, and it's an amouage through and through with that beautiful frankincense and oud accord and, and that Oriental. It's bold. For 2009, this is a bold, bold release. So, um, Epic Woman, I mean, Christopher Chong's releases just, uh, continue to look better and better with age. And instead of, you know, taking that legacy and running with it, the new guy's just living off of them like a vampire, you know, exceptional extra and almost double the price this. And, you know, these releases, I, I have an entire video dedicated to the new releases on Amouage. You can go check that out. It's under my live streams. Where we're talking about search and purpose and all that stuff, they are all no, absolutely not. They're not going for people like us, and that makes me sad. So, anyways, that's my uh, that's my review. That's my uh, ranked Cecile Zerokian list perfumers portfolio video, um, and also my unboxing of Camor. Hope you guys appreciated the video. It was a pleasure as always. Uh, thanks for the support, everybody. It really does mean a lot. You guys really lift me up. I love doing these for you guys. So cheers, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.